We have a two-minute warning for the press briefing, a two-minute warning for the press briefing. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay, go ahead, kick us off. Uh, there's some reporting that we like to confirm regarding a, a call in, June, in July, rather, between President Biden and former Afghanistan President Ghani. One, that, that both leaders appeared completely unaware that the Taliban would take over, and secondly, that they discussed plans to project that Afghan forces were still in control. Can, is that accurate? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I'm not going to get into private diplomatic conversations or leaked transcripts of phone calls. Uh, but what I can reiterate for you is that we have stated many times that no one anticipated, uh, the vast majority I should say, there may have been individuals and agencies, so I don't want to eliminate that option, but uh, our uh, national security team and no one in Congress or I would say most people out in the public anticipated that the Taliban would be able to take over the country as quickly as they did, or that the Afghan National Security Forces would fold as quickly as they did. At that point in time, have some sort of uh, a perception that even the former president of Afghanistan didn't have that confidence in the Afghan forces. Is that why maybe he was pushing uh, Ghani to, to be more stern and to be more confident? They needed to be united. They needed to show the country and the Afghan people they were going to fight and they were going to lead through this transition, even as U.S. forces left. That is entirely consistent with what he has said publicly throughout. Was the president in any way pushing a false narrative in that call with the Afghan president? I think it's pretty clear. Again, I'm not going to go into details of a private conversation, but what we saw over the course of the last few months is a, a collapse in leadership. And that was happening even before Ghani left the country. Uh, broad question about the Zelensky meeting that's underway. Um, just the, the events, demands, phone calls that led up to the 2019 impeachment. I'm just wondering, uh, did they factor in any way into the way the White House prepared for this meeting, specifically the fact that Hunter Biden was a key part of those conversations with the last administration and Zelensky? And did President Biden expect in any way, shape, or form to address that dynamic in today's meeting? No. Jeff? Uh, Jen, while I'm Zelensky, sure. uh, President Zelensky said in the office today that he was eager to hear President Biden's vision for uh, Ukraine's chances of joining NATO. And he also said he'd like a time frame for that. What is President Biden's vision right now, and does he have a time frame? Well, I think it's important for people to understand, not you necessarily, but everyone out there, that this is not a decision that the United States makes, right? We continue to support uh, and, sh and we continue to call for ensuring that NATO's door remains open to aspirants when they are ready and able to meet the commitments and obligations of membership and contribute to security in the Euro-Atlantic area. This is NATO membership. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. Joe Biden is appointed the point person by Barack Obama to two countries on policy, China and Ukraine. And in both of those countries, they happen to be the epicenters of Hunter Biden's uh, business activities. The president was in Brussels. He was asked about Ukraine getting into the NATO membership action plan. And at the time, he said, schools out on that question. Um, I know the meeting's ongoing, but was that expected to come up in the meeting? And is the president's position still the same? Uh, again, as I noted a little bit earlier, there are specific steps uh, the Ukrainians need to take in order to uh, meet the requirements of NATO membership. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> you got fired. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, President Biden uh, will be 79 years old on November 20th. During the campaign, there was a lot of talk about how old he is and how uh, he will not be able to survive uh, in, at the White House, especially in time of crisis. But we've seen him during this crisis, the COVID crisis, the hurricane crisis, the Afghanistan crisis. 
Do you think that people should, those who uh, call him Steepy Joe, should apologize to him? I don't think we're looking for an apology. I think we're looking uh, for allowing the president to continue to address, address multiple crises at a time, which is exactly what he's been doing over the past few weeks. We just signed a, got a UN Security Council resolution passed in coordination with a number of these countries uh, to make clear to the Taliban what our expectations are. Has the administration reached out to Saudi about what appears to be Riyadh's concern that they can no longer rely on Washington? We are in touch with a range of partners, including leaders in Saudi Arabia. I'd point you to the State Department for any updated uh, conversations with them. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. See you tomorrow. What about Americans left behind in Afghanistan, Jen? The president said the buck stopped with him. Can you share a lot on that? What does the president plan to do to get Americans back home? He also said yesterday he's getting them home, and we're going to do exactly that. Thank you, Jen. I would note that yesterday the UN Security Council also signed a, a passed a resolution uh, that made clear to what the expectation is in terms of safe travel uh, and evacuation or departure, I should say, of individuals who want to leave Afghanistan. But also the expectation of 100 countries around the world, the UN Security Council and others, that the Taliban will abide by what they committed to last Friday. Um, when the president took office, there was a deadline that was just three months away that included for May First, that included no requirement that the Taliban work out a cooperative governing agreement with the Afghan government. It did release 5,000 prisoners last year, including some of the Taliban's top war commanders. So the president was walking into that circumstance. Uh, he wanted to leave Afghanistan. It's a war he has long felt we needed to depart from. He's, feel, he's felt that was long overdue. Uh, but that was the circumstance he walked into. And frankly, there's a little bit of selective memory loss from some of the people who served in the last administration about these circumstances. Go ahead. Uh, so we heard from the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan this morning of Good Morning America. He's mentioned that 98% of those on the ground there in Afghanistan and a small number who remain, they have reached out, uh, they got out, you know, as many people as, as they could. Um, is the administration essentially placing blame on Americans who could not get to the airport in time? I think what the president stated clearly, and I know that Jake Sullivan has stated clearly, and our Secretary of State has stated clearly, is that our commitment remains. Uh, there is not an end to our commitment to American citizens who are in Afghanistan who want to leave. That's the same for any country in the world, for American citizens who want to leave and want to come home to the United States. It's also important for people to note and understand what the process has been and what we've undergone over the past few months. And that's what the president laid out. Uh, and we think it's still important for the American people here in the United States to understand that. One on Al-Qaeda. So we heard from the president a few moments ago saying that one of the main reasons to go into this war was to get Al-Qaeda. We have heard that Osama bin Laden's security chief has reportedly returned to Afghanistan and has been seen in public. Do you still believe, or does the administration believe, that Al-Qaeda is no longer a threat to America? And given the ISIS attacks that we've seen in the last week, how confident is the administration that Afghanistan isn't already a safe haven for terrorists? Well, I think first there is a very big difference between terrorist's ability to attack U.S. troops in Kabul and to attack the homeland. Holy fuck! This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. Was it a mistake for the president to have promised that we would remain until everybody left the country? We are going to get every American citizen out. That has not changed. And I think the president clearly outlined that we're going to be watching, as the world will, uh, what the Taliban does. That is certainly allowing American citizens to depart. It's certainly allowing Afghans and our partners to depart. It's also uh, how they operate as it relates to treatment of women, to human rights. There's a range of factors at play here. So I don't have anything to predict for you. Obviously, there's a great deal of economic leverage you referenced sanctions that are already in place uh, that we have, uh, that the global community has, and we'll have to assess how things happen over the course of the coming days, weeks, and months. Go ahead, Jackie.
Um, one question on the dignified transfer, and I want to get to Afghanistan. Uh, that he is uh, grateful to their uh, sons and daughters, the sacrifice uh, they made to the country, that he knows uh, firsthand what it's like to lose a child and the fact that no one can tell you uh, anything or say anything or there's no words that are going to fill that hole that is left by that. Uh, he's not going to speak to and I'm not going to speak to the private conversations. Of course they have the right uh, to convey whatever they would like. But I will tell you from spending a lot of time with him over the past couple of days that he was deeply impacted by these family members who he met uh, oh, just two days ago, uh, that he talks about them frequently in meetings and, and the incredible service and sacrifice of their son and daughters. I, I, that is not going to change their suffering, but uh, I wanted to convey that still. The president also said in his speech that that assumption about how long the Afghan government would hold on, how long the military would be able to hold on, he acknowledged that that was a failed assumption. Who is responsible for that assumption? Is the president frustrated with his team at all for having made that false assumption? We don't have the luxury of being frustrated. Uh, our focus right now is on uh, continuing to move forward on our diplomatic efforts. Uh, and continuing to do everything we can to get our Afghan partners and American citizens out and to get Afghans who have fought by our side uh, safely settled in the United States and third countries around the world. Go ahead. Was that like a military assumption though or was that an assumption coming from I don't from think the anyone assessed about? that they would collapse as quickly as they did anyone. Anyone in this room, anyone in the region, anyone anywhere in the world. If you have anyone who did, I'd be surprised. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, the Afghan interpreter who helped uh, rescue then Senator Joe Biden when he was stranded 13 years ago in Afghanistan is now in hiding. He told the Wall Street Journal, Journal, hello, Mr. President, save me and my family, don't forget me. What's your response to him and why is he and other Afghan allies like him still in the country if the president believes, as he said today, that the mission was an extraordinary success? Well, I would say first our message to him is thank you for fighting by our side. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, just to build on some of the things my colleagues were saying, President Biden said Americans who uh, were given multiple chances to leave, uh, dating back several months, um, but things, as you just noted, changed dramatically in the last few weeks. My question is, how many of those families said they wanted to stay in Afghanistan in the last few weeks, two, three weeks? And is it really fair to say, for the president to say, that they didn't leave when they had the chance? As you just mentioned, no one expected the collapse uh, as happened. And the president himself, for months, was publicly saying that the Taliban would not be running things. Um, and, that this, and also that this exit would be safe and organized. Well, I, I would say first that no one is placing blame here. I think it's important for people to understand, though, what the process has been. And uh, while there are between 100 and 200 American citizens who have not yet departed, uh, we have also evacuated more than 5,500 American citizens and their family members and 115,000 other people from Afghanistan. It was less than two weeks ago when the president told ABC yes when he was asked, are you committed to making sure troops stay until every American who wants to get out gets out? He said yes. So obviously situations have changed, the threat increased as you've said, but why should those Americans believe that this commitment is enduring when 13 days ago that commitment changed? Because he's evacuated 5,500 American citizens and their family members and 120,000 total people over the last two weeks, nearly all of them since that time. Would you be willing to, would this administration be willing to sit before a hearing? Some, some in this administration go before Congress and answer questions about their part in this war. Again, I think we've clearly already been participating in Congress's asks and we have already been briefing them. There haven't been specific requests made that I'm aware of and as they come, we'll speak to those. The specific allegations from our sources on the ground and people who are assisting in these rescue operations who say that because of inconsistent policies, conflicting policies, and also a lack of coordination between the State Department and the Pentagon, uh, and also competing interests from people in Washington with influence who are pulling strings, this creates a chaos in which vulnerable Afghans, including SIVs, were left behind, but individuals who may not have a, uh, who is not an at-risk individual, 
gets to leave. So is the administration willing to admit responsibility for this situation and what would be your remedy? I have no confirmation of what you've just outlined. What I will tell you is that 117,000 approximately, many of them Afghans, who, people who were not American citizens, were evacuated. That's more people than ever in any airlift in U.S. history. For the Americans who are currently in hiding and who very much want to come home, not the other set, um, what is the administration's message to them? Should they try and head to the border? Should they try and book a flight out of there? Or should they remain in hiding? and hope that the diplomacy kicks in. Well, I, I would just note that we are in touch with a number of these Americans. Um, not every one, perhaps, but we are in touch. We may be. We are in touch with as many of them who we can make contact with through a range of means. Uh, that continues. Uh, and what our focus is on now, and we'll have day-by-day -day updates, and this is a very fair and good question, is uh, how can we ensure operationally that there are a range of options for uh, people to be able to depart? Some of that may be over land, over borders. Uh, some of that may be through uh, airplanes. Uh, and so we're working again with the Qataris and the Turks on that. We're working to get the civilian side of the airport operational, but those are all pieces we're focused on. Is the administration preparing for worst case scenario in some circumstances, hostage situations? Look, our focus right now is on making clear uh, to the Taliban and to others uh, in Afghanistan that uh, we are going to get these American citizens out, that we are going to hold them to that account. And that's our focus. Thanks, everyone. I'll be back tomorrow. Why didn't he name them? Hi, everyone. Hi. So we have. Uh, another special guest today, uh, a return visitor, Deputy National Security Advisor Ann Neuberger, who's going to speak to you uh, briefly about cyber threats. Uh, she only has time for just a very few questions because she has to run off to a meeting. Uh, I will always be the bad cop um, with that. Come on up and then we'll of course do a full briefing. Good afternoon, everyone. So we want to take a moment to encourage organizations to be on guard for malicious cyber activity in advance of the holiday weekend. To be clear, we have no specific threat information or information regarding attacks this weekend, but what we do have is history. And finally is this, calling on Americans, organizations to do the steps they need to do to be as safe as possible in advance of what may be an increased threat, as we've seen in history, for the reasons I noted during the holiday weekend. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll be see well. you again, I'm certain. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for taking the time. Okay. okay. Are there any updates on the 100 to 200 Americans who, American citizens who uh, were in the country or are still in the country? Do you believe they still are? What's the latest uh, on the diplomatic mission? As it is closer to 100, uh, we are in close touch uh, from the State Department, uh, from our diplomatic officials with all of these individuals, working in close coordination with them to determine how they can leave the country, if they've left the country. There have been reports, as I think many of you have seen or reported yourself, about charter flights. If I can just make a speak to that for a moment, because I know it's been a popular question. Uh, we, there have been some confusion about this. Uh, we don't, do not have personnel on the ground, nor do we have air assets in the country, to, and we don't control the airspace. Uh, so anyone who's suggesting we are preventing these flights, that's not accurate. We, don't, we couldn't prevent a charter flight from taking off. Card holders and SIV applicants remain in Afghanistan. Let me give you, well, l let me give you first, and, and, uh, and I'll get to your question, but it reminds me I wanted to give you guys an update on one piece that was asked yesterday, which is how many people have come into the country, and this is something that DHS will be providing regular updates on, but just to give you an understanding of the breakdown, and then I will come back to your question, Jackie, I promise. First, between August 17th and August 31st, of the breakdown of people who have come into the country, 31,170 107, I'm sorry, people have arrived in the United States as a part of Operation Allies Welcome. Uh, 4,446 are U.S. citizens, 14 percent of them. 2,785, or 9 percent, are U.S. lawful permanent residents. 23,876, or 77 percent, this is the statistic I gave yesterday, which I then later butchered in the briefing, are other Afghans at risk, including SIV and other visa holders, SIV applicants, P1 and P2 referrals, and others. Uh, note that this group includes a small number of third country nationals that uh, were also evacuated and processed. We will give updates on that. That's obviously the, the data as of just a couple of days ago. 
In terms of your question, which is a very good one, Jackie, in terms of how many people are in the country now, there are people who are eligible. We may not even know they're eligible yet, right? It is very hard to define those numbers. That is something that certainly the State Department, uh, in coordination with the Department of Homeland Security, are going to be assessing uh, what we think the population is and how we can work with this population to ensure that we uh, help individuals who want to leave and want to depart the country to depart. Some of those people may be eligible for a range of our programs, SIV programs, P1, P2 programs. Some of them may not, but they still want to, may want to depart the country. Now, as I noted yesterday, and I've noted several times, everybody who wants to leave Afghanistan and come to the United States will not be able to and will not be eligible. And we don't want to set the expectation that will be the case. But what we want to do is try to assess and try to do extensive outreach through, outreach through diplomatic channels to see how many people there are, what programs they might be eligible for. Thank you. And then I want to get to the um, Taliban and questions of whether it's keeping its promise uh, for amnesty. Uh, there was some reporting from the BBC, uh, some color from that story. Since the Taliban came to power, one man said they haven't stopped killing. A few days ago, this person said they killed 12 members of special forces in Kandahar, three soldiers in Jalalabad as well. The Taliban took them out of their homes and shot them. Given this kind of reporting that we're hearing, is it possible that our reliance on the Taliban to keep their word in terms of our evacuation is misplaced for going back on things like the amnesty promise? Well, first, I don't have any confirmation of those details. I'm not questioning the BBC's reporting. I just don't have any confirmation of them from the U.S. government. I would certainly point you to the Department of Defense and others who might have additional details. But what I would note here, Jackie, is no one is saying from the federal government, no one, the president, the secretary of defense, no one from the intelligence community, that the Taliban are good actors. Some groups are anticipating about 50,000 Afghans coming to the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you, is that an estimate that you're able to confirm? Mm -hmm. And is there anything more uh, that you can share on what status they will arrive? Will most of them have humanitarian parole, yeah. SIVs, P1, P2s? And how will that, those numbers be applied uh, to the refugee cap? Will they be part of the 125,000 that's been committed to or sure. in addition? These are all really good questions that are being discussed by uh, the team as we speak. But let me try to answer what I can answer at this point in time. Uh, so right now, the U.S. military bases, uh, they confirmed about two days ago uh, that they had about 20,000 people. That may have, number may have gone down now, so I would certainly encourage you to ask them for an updated number if that's of interest. They are working towards space for about 50,000. Now, there are people who come to this country, American citizens and others, who have family members who may not go to those military base, U.S. citizens, of course, who may not go to those bases, and those bases are meant to be ter temporary regardless. In terms of what classification, so as you know, there are different classifications people have come into the country under from Afghanistan. The SIV, the Special Immigrant Visa Program, P1, P2 programs. Some have come in through parolee programs. And yes, we are having discussions about over the long term what this looks like. Right now, refugees who come in as refugee status would be under the refugee cap. Uh, but beyond that, I, I have to let the policy process see itself through. It's a, it's a good question. Go ahead. 125,000, do you know that? I apologize. Oh, sorry, about whether, say that one more time. What was the question about that? 125,000. Will yeah. it be in addition to the committed refugee cap of 125,000? Or will it be uh, just the 50,000 or whatever the number is? Does it fall? Well, 50,000, a lot of those people are special immigrant visa applicants, right? Or through other programs. So that, that wouldn't be under a refugee cap. Go ahead. Um, on Afghanistan, the Taliban says China will be their main partner and kind of financial lifeline. Does that weaken America's leverage over the group to change its behavior, especially given the geographic closeness between China and Afghanistan? Well, I would first say that, um, as the President has said many times, uh, so let me repeat, uh, there are a few countries that wanted us to stay in Afghanistan more than China and Russia. Uh, what the, our leverage over the Taliban uh, is, is a range of, 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 of things. We have sacrificed a lot for this alliance, and including the lives of 41 Australians, and we've been left uh, seemingly out of the loop during this withdrawal process. There hasn't been high-level communication with the Australian government during this time. So I don't think that's true. I don't think that we have not engaged with the Australian government. We have worked with our partners around the world to evacuate individuals from a range of countries around the world who need evacuating from the country. I would say, and the President would say if he were standing here, those 41 Australians did not die in vain. 
and we are incredibly grateful for their partnership. We're incredibly grateful for their support over the course of a 20-year war, and Australia remains a pivotal partner to the United States. What is the administration's position on the national resistance front led by Ahmed bin Saud? And is the U.S. talking to or assisting them in, or in any way supporting them in reaching their goals? Uh, I don't have anything to read out in terms of engagements with them. I'd point you to the State Department. Stop regarding China as a threat and as an adversary. End quote. Does the administration see China as an adversary in this regard, and are you willing to meet them in the middle to make progress on climate change? Well, uh, the United States sees China as a country where we have disagreements, and we also have areas where we can work together. And that's what complicated diplomatic relationships look like, and certainly our relationship with China falls into that category. Thanks, everyone, so much. I don't think I'm going to have anything new to what I already, already answered on that, but we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.